Thank you for choosing CTN. And now, it's time with Herman and Sharon. I love you. Thank you Hi, for joining everybody. us. This is my wife, Sharon. That's right. right. She remembered. We've been celebrating <laughs> some time We've off. We've been celebrating our, for several this years. Is, this is anniversary month. <laughs> so yeah, it is. 56 years we've been uh, married, and so we felt, hey, we'll just do the whole month. Why not? Absolutely. We deserve it. <laughs> Anybody that can stay together for 56 years deserve yeah. a holiday yeah. for the I, whole month. Actually, you should. You deserve a gold <laughs> Oscar. An Oscar? Yes. Uh, really? I mean, uh, yeah, oh. Academy Award for staying Will it me. look like you? <laughs> no, 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 let's hope not. But uh, uh, no, it, it was a great, great time together. Always is. We kept. We, we have a kept, good time together. We kept thanking the Lord at our age. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that, and that's true. That, that we're we not going to talk about our age. We can still walk, uh, <laughs> and uh, and and <laughs> by the way, we walk pretty fast too. By the way, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's 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 really just a marvelous uh, time together. We we were eating in. Uh, a restaurant uh, on the on the beach, and this particular restaurant, you look out the window and you can actually see where we met in college across the bay in yeah. 1958. Wow. Mm -hmm. And and the waitress was there. And I said, Weird. I said, see those <laughs> condos over because it used to be a college, and now they yeah, the land tore it so down. expensive. They sold it and tore it down and put condos there. I said, see those condos over there? And she goes, yes, isn't that beautiful? I said. That's where we met in 1958 in college. And she goes, That's where Trinity College was located. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, right the, there in Clearwater. One of the greatest schools. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I mean, just to sit there and think of that, that when I was a young guy looking from that campus over to that strip of land, there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. And now it's completely covered with condos and That's right. all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's amazing. In 56 years, we're yeah. still together. Yes, we are. 35 years doing this. And we're historians. We can tell people what it used to <laughs> be right. like I have, ago. I have a fascinating <laughs> story today. This yes. guy, he's a pastor. Uh, his name is, is Michael R. Dixon, and he is the pastor of a great church in the Carolinas. Uh, I bet it's cool right now, and I wish I could blow some of that coolness right here. <laughs> I love the name of your church. Yes, thank you. What's the name of it? Sandy Man. Bottom Baptist Church. <laughs> Sandy you, Bottom Baptist Church. get any church. better than that. Do I you, know. Do you enjoy preaching? I love it. See, That's I, my calling on my life. That's I, a passion I have to preach. I ask pastors that or preachers. I have yet to, you know, I'm looking for the first one. Yeah. I can't stand it. I have to do it. <laughs> God told me to do this. Uh, but every one of them, including our son-in-law who's a preacher, says, I love preaching. Yes. Your life is rather unusual, and you're going to have an opportunity to have this wonderful book. There it is on your screen. Casting Down Idols. It, I read a lot of books. Very few of them are page turners. Many of them I have to wait until I dig into it a little, like halfway, mm -hmm. before I really get it. Yours starts out really good. Here's some of it. Every addiction or spiritual idol in the heart begins with a dissec de de deceptive message. That's right. My tongue is not working today. Yes. <laughs> It'll get there. Mm -hmm. Why do you say that? Well, you know, Jesus said in John 8, 32, that you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. A little bit later in that chapter, in John chapter 8, verse 44, he talks about the devil and he says he's a liar and the father of all liars. Amen. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus said the truth will set you free, then a lie is going to do what? It's going to put you in bondage. It's going to tie you up. It's going to steal that freedom away from you. And when we think about any temptation that comes upon us, where the devil wants to draw us away from God and where we need to be in relationship with him, there's always lies associated with that temptation. Wow. And we need, that's why the Bible says over and over again we need to renew our minds, we need to transform our thinking. Now you had, you had uh, uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, before you surrendered your life to Christ. That's right. So, so this pastor that's standing up there in that pulpit delivering that message, probably a lot of people that wander into your church were, would look at you and go, I've got problems that he's never even heard about. Look at him. Right. If he only knew me. Mm -hmm. Now you must be confronted often 
with, but you don't understand me. Mm -hmm. And yet you've gone yes. through a, this life. You, you talk about addiction to pornography, all kinds mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. How does a guy involved in that lifestyle we're looking at today? What happened? How did that take place? The grace of God. And that's really what this book's all about. It's about the grace of God mm -hmm. through the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And my heart really in this book and writing this book is that God will use this book to touch hearts that are in the same place that I once was. Yeah. And it's only by the power of God that he delivered me from that. If in high school, I'd have been the least, I'd have been the last one anyone would ever suspect of going into the ministry mm -hmm. because of the darkness that I lived in back then. Now, take, were you take, raised in a, I'm sorry, were you raised in a Christian home or I, were you I not? was, yes. My mother made sure that me and my two brothers went to church. So we were in vacation Bible school and uh, involved in scouts, which then was uh, you know, church-based. I know it still is, but I think more so back then. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I knew what the gospel was, and I knew what I needed to do. In fact, at 13 years old, I knew that God had called me to preach. That's the last thing I wanted to do Good. was to preach. Uh, I was withdrawn. You know, when we Introvert? Would, yes, yes, certainly. We'd go on uh, summer vacation, and then school would start back. One of the first things they want you to do day one Stand up and tell us what you did over the summer. Oh, I used to hate that too. <laughs> yeah, oh. my stomach would be tied in yeah. knots. Especially I'd when they so would nervous. say, give your name. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> Go on. Right. And uh, so the last thing I wanted to do was do anything where I was going to be out in front of a group. Sure. Any type of public speaking. Sure. That scared me to death. I relate. So at 13 years old, when I realized God had called me to do that, and I decided that's not what I want to do. I took off running, and I can identify with Jonah and his story so well. <laughs> I wasn't a big fish that swallowed me, but I tell you what, it felt, I'm sure it felt the same way it was for Jonah when he was in the belly of that fish. Now, take us on a journey, mm -hmm. you know, realizing that we only have 30 minutes. Right. But take us on a journey of how that page in your life turned to all of this experimental lifestyle. Well, you know, the world today, psychology, for example, refers to dysfunction, uh, your dysfunctional upbringing. So they try to figure out why you are like you are, why you think the way you sure. think, and they try to connect the dots as far as the home you grew up in and things that you were exposed to. Of course, the Bible calls dysfunction sin. Yeah. And the problem is we're all born with a sinful heart. We all have a sin nature. And then we grow up in a sinful world. Every one of us do. And so, you know, I know it comes at us in different ways, but still sin is sin. And that sin affects who you are, and it kind of molds you. And uh, unless you meet Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, see, what, what you need is a heart transformation. Christ is the only one that can bring that heart transformation. Isn't it amazing, though, how Satan puts in your life an uncle oh, yes. turned you toward pornography and Drugs, alcohol. All of that. Mm -hmm. Why did you go that direction when you had the right direction. Isn't it interesting? That it is. our nat natural inclination is to sin. Right. That's right. Yeah. And as a young boy growing up, and I talk about this a little bit in my book, my relationship with my father was not the best. Yes. And it wasn't because of my father. It had more to do with my rebellious heart. Um, my dad had a way of disciplining us with anger which was not right, but uh, the way I responded to that in my sinful heart was to push back. When I felt like he was pushing me, I'd push back. Mm -hmm. And so I yearned for that attention in my life that I didn't seem to get from my father. And here was this uncle that the enemy had placed in my life that was such a wicked, evil influence on me. And I began to look to him when I was only probably 12 years old. And of course, he abused me sexually, went on for a period of years. And I talk about that a little bit in this book. Um, and it helps you to understand how you end up where you are. That's right. Uh, but it's all the plan of the enemy. And even look back back now, when I knew at 13 years old that God had called me to preach, the enemy was going to do everything he could to stop that. And I believe the enemy goes after all of us, but the devil and the demons especially want to go after God's anointed. Amen. Mm -hmm. If God has his hand on your life and he wants to use you for ministry, you have to really be on guard. Your first right. marriage? I was married at 19 years old. My first wife was 15. High school sweetheart. I was uh, into drugs heavy, alcohol abuse, not getting along with my father. And so I saw that as a way out of my dad's home under, from out under his authority. Yeah. 
And so uh, my first wife was 15 years old. Her daddy had to sign for her to get married. And I thought, well, this is how I can get away from my father. I can get out of his home. So I moved out of my dad's home and moved into her dad's home, wow. which was not very smart. <laughs> uh, that didn't work out too well. And three years later, that marriage ended in divorce. Uh, my wife left me. Uh, not for the first time, after several times, and uh, the last time it was for good, and she left. Just tired of the drug abuse, and uh, she was involved in it as well. I mean, she'd go out for the weekend, you know, come back two or three days later. I would do the same thing. No marriage is going to work. No. <laughs> under, under that kind of situation. Um, and that was probably the lowest point in my life. So She left me for the first, yes, yeah. certainly. A darkness just overwhelmed me. Um, I found myself using drugs that I swore when I started my drug use, I'd never be so stupid as to pick up a needle and inject heroin or cocaine into my blood system. And that's where the devil got me. He got me to that place where I didn't care if I lived or died. Uh, depression, mm -hmm. darkness, loneliness. What happened? Well, you see, growing up, that influence that my mother had on me and taking me to church, I knew what I needed to do. I knew what the answer was, but still, even at that point in my life, I wasn't ready to surrender. So you talk about hard-headed. I guess I was really hard-headed and stubborn, but I continued to run. Um, I met my wife, Melissa. Uh, we celebrate 30 years of marriage this fall. Amen. And uh, God has used her in a, a miraculous way in my life. But two, two, two and a half years into this marriage, our marriage was headed for trouble. And we knew, we both knew, if we don't do something, you know, our marriage is not going to last. You brought some of the past with you. Oh, certainly. I was still using drugs, still living the same kind of lifestyle, even into my second marriage. Uh, but yet I knew the gospel of Christ was the answer. And so in brokenness, my wife and I both knelt down at an old-fashioned altar at a midweek prayer service in my mother's church and surrendered to Christ. At your mother's church? Yes, at my mother's what church. What kind of church? Uh, it was a non-denominational church right outside of Washington, North Carolina. So your mom was a priest? What? No, no. Oh. This was the church my mother went to. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. Gotcha. Right. Gotcha. All right. So I refer to it as my mother's church. But that's <laughs> okay. where she was a member. <laughs> okay. She was active. I got gotcha. you. Right. All right. Uh, so I knew where the answer was, but it wasn't until that point in time that I had the power I needed to change. Wow. You know, there have been many times in my life before that point in time where I'd woke up with a headache hangover, couldn't remember what I'd done for three days before. Uh, and I'd look at my wife, Melissa, and she'd be broken, she'd be crying. And I'd make a promise to her, I promise this is it, this is the last time. I'm gonna change. I'm gonna turn over a new leaf, I'm gonna stop. And guess what, five, six days later, right back into the same. You can't do it. Right. You can't do right. it. Right, not in the flesh. No, Yeah. you can't do it. And that's really what this book is all about. It's yes. casting down idols That's the why power that's, of the gospel. That's why when I started reading, I go, man, this is for everybody <laughs> yes. watching mm -hmm. because we can relate. Mm -hmm. When we try to do it, you can't do it. That's right. So I didn't have the power to change as much as I wanted to. And it wasn't that I was not sincere about the promises I was making. I oh, was you were sincere, sincere. Sure. yes. But I just didn't have the power in me to apply that change to my life. That moment you were sincere. Yes. And then the next day comes. That's right. Yeah. And you fall right back into the ruts. And it wasn't until I surrendered to Christ and my precious wife was by my side, when I got up off of my knees from that altar, I was a changed man. And I had the power I didn't have before mm -hmm. to walk in newness of life. You know, God created us to worship, so we're going to end up worshiping something or someone. Right. And when I talk about casting down idols, that's what I'm referring to. And even an atheist who would say, um, I don't believe in a God, he has a God. Right. It's whatever is number one in that person's life becomes that person's God. And if it's not God Almighty, then you're worshiping an idol. And what can an idol do for you? Absolutely nothing. No. Yeah. It's not a real God. You've got to cast down those idols and begin to worship God, the Creator, for whom you were created to worship. Wow. Right. I, I like the way your book's laid out. Uh, you actually have a page where they can write that's right and talk about themselves a journal yes why did you do that I want to reinforce the biblical truth that I'm talking about in those chapters and uh, my heart when God laid this book on my heart and I put it off for years and it took me a few years to write this book I really poured my heart out and laid it out uh, but God led me to write this book really with the intent of helping uh, groups like in a, a Christian based rehab center where men could take this book or even women could take this book 
and actually work through their addiction Excellent. with the truth of the Word of God. Because this book's not about Mike Dixon. This book is about Jesus Christ and the power he offers, not just for, to, for me, but for anyone who's struggling. Uh, yeah, when I read your book, I think of the woman at the well. Yes. Or Jesus. Mm -hmm. Where's are your accusers? Mm -hmm. And he says, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like you do all the things that you know you're supposed to do and then I'll stop accusing you. He said, neither do I could accuse you. That's right. Go and sin no more. That's right. So that's, that's, that's yes. salvation. Yes, sir. That's when it comes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now you said you had, to, that gave you the power to change, but when did you decide that you did want to be this calling, being a pastor like you felt the Lord was calling you to? Well, it was a short time after uh, my wife and I surrendered. I was 27 years old and I, it, it may have been a year a year to two years after that point that mm -hmm. I surrendered. I said, okay, God, if you still want me to preach, I'm yeah. gonna surrender to you. Wow. Because he had already done so much for me already. I mean, he had saved my soul, but he also saved my life. I had buddies, drug buddies who were already, who had already died, overdosed, got a hold of bad drugs, whatever, um, and who were found dead at a very early age. And so he had already done so much for me. So, okay, God, I owe it all to you. You know, that's really that song that we sing sometimes in our church for invitation, I surrender all, I surrender all. When you get to that point in your life where you truly surrender all to Him. Amen. You know, doesn't the psalmist say that God loves a broken and contrite heart? Mm -hmm. and that's where I had to get before I really began to look up and surrender everything to Him. And then it's like, wow, wow. man, just look at what God can do in a life that just says, here I am. You, I'm sure, in the lifestyle that you had, when you talk to young men or men that are even women that mm -hmm. are about to destroy their marriage, their life, they're deceived. Right. Now you, you, you can talk to that, can't you? Yes. Because deception mm -hmm. is that very object that keeps us glued to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. How did you get out of that? Mm -hmm. Well, it was the truth of the gospel. You know, my mother's uh, Christian faith and her diligence Amazing. in you making always go sure. back to your mom. Well, she had the greatest influence in my life um, as a spiritual mentor and to, to lead me to the truth. Wow. Well, what's the old expression? You lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And my mother knew that. And, uh, you know, as a pastor, I know that. All you can do is you can plant the seed. And it's up to the Holy Spirit of God to bring forth the fruit. And so the seed was already there. You know, I knew the gospel was what I needed, and, I, and what I needed to do is just stop running yeah. and say, okay, here, Lord, here I am. And it's interesting that when I got to the point where I surrendered and stopped running, the thing that I had feared the most, that was the calling on my life, has turned out to be one of the greatest joys in you, my life. You have a term, bullseye living. Yes. What is that? God's created us to live for a certain purpose. And I ask people many times in the counseling room, I ask people this question, what are you living for? What do you want out of life more than anything else? Right. You know what the number one answer is? Tell me. I just want to be happy. Yeah. And so that person who's living with that goal, that's their bullseye. They're aiming for that. So every decision they make, every choice they make in life is geared towards what they think is going to make them happy. Mm -hmm. So they're aiming for that. Uh, sometimes people answer the question and say, well, I want to be successful. So that's going to be the mark that they're going to aim for, everything they do. God created us for a higher purpose. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. God created me to live that way. Wow. If I live any other way, I'm living contrary to the reason and purpose I was created to live. You had a change of direction. Repentance. It, it, it's amazing, because I've counseled a lot of people, obviously, at my age. <laughs> doing all of this you've, you've gone through a lot of that right. but and I know you have the same experience when they leave your office you know whether they heard you mm. or whether they walked out of there and probably could not repeat what you said when they got to the car yes mm -hmm. that deception yes how do you move from that and basically that's the center of their life mm -hmm. deception they're now mm -hmm going for that every day. How do you move that target? Well, a lot of people for their foundation of morality and what's right and wrong, if they don't have the Bible as the foundation, 
then they're going to have all kinds of problems in that area. But how do you get a person that is already in deception you to even, even want to pick up the Bible? Right. Because they look at that like, well, you may understand that. Right. I don't even know what it's talking about. Yes, right. And that's why the gospel presentation, the salvation's got to be the first step. Yeah. Without that, they don't have the power. I mean, I can sit with a drug addict all day long and tell them, you know, repentance and uh, trust the power of God. He can give you a new life. But unless they surrender, you know, the Holy Spirit has to do that work. I can't do that work and you can't do that work. Right. And so we have to trust God to do what only He can do, and that's convict right. the heart and draw that lost person to Him. But we all end up worshiping. And, you know, it's just like if you were driving a nail on a board and you grab a screwdriver and you start whacking that nail with a screwdriver, it's not going to work. Why? Because a screwdriver was never created to drive a nail in a board. What do you need? You need a hammer. And so it's the same way in my worship to God. God created me to worship Him. And if I'm worshiping anything or anyone else, I'm like grabbing that screwdriver, whacking that nail. It's just not working. You're, you're a neat storyteller. You, have, you tell a story about a one-arm top handball player. Yes. Put that analogy in. Yes, yes. Uh, that's a true story. Uh, this uh, man was very athletic, and he loved to play all kinds of sports, and he was in an accident where he lost an arm, and he's very depressed. He got to a place of darkness where he didn't want to live anymore, and a friend just kept at him and encouraging him to take up handball, of all things. And he's only got one hand, one arm. Sure. And so he began to practice. He found out he was pretty good at it, and so he kept right on until he mastered that sport, went into competitions, won many awards. He was in an interview, and I talk about that in this book, where the uh, interviewer asked him, you know, how do you do that? How do you compete with one hand, one arm, and yet win so many trophies and awards? And he said, well, it's simply this. When the ball's coming my opponent's way, he has to make a choice. Am I going to hit it with my right hand or my left hand? He <laughs> said, when the ball's coming at me, I've already made that choice. Because <laughs> <Right? laughs> he's only got one hand. <laughs> right. That's why. But a lot, a lot of what we do is choices that we make. Yeah. You know, God loves us. I mean, John 3, 16, first verse many of us ever memorized, for God so loved the world. What did he do? Right. He, he became a man, Jesus, and he died for us on the cross of Calvary. Not only so our sins would be forgiven and we'd go to heaven, but also so we'd have life here. You know, John 10, 10, Jesus said he came to give life more abundantly. That's this side of glory. So I get that abundant life now here. But I've got to first of all receive the gospel. I've got to believe in what God's offering me and that's salvation through Christ. And then I need to walk in that truth. Have you ever met and helped an individual that was as messed up as you were? Oh yes. You have? Even more so. And you've, and you've seen success. that change? Yes. And what an honor that is because it's not about me, it's about the gospel and the power of the gospel. Wow. But you got to have a heart that's receptive mm -hmm. and ready to receive the truth, first of salvation, and then they can apply the truth of God to their life and live in freedom. Yeah, <laughs> you have the ability to write. Where did that come from? How did, how did you put this on pages? Because, I mean, I've done a lot of cr crazy things in my life. I can't write it. I can speak it, I can't write it. Mm -hmm. How did you do this? But God. Did you have to relive really, it? I did. I, I mean, I sat and cried over the manuscripts. Uh, a lot of things I reveal in this book, I had never shared before. Uh, there was Obviously. A series, <laughs> Obviously. Yes. There's a series of uh, sermons that I prepared. You know, I entitled it Radically Saved. Yeah. And I actually preached through that series of messages. And once I got through that series of messages, I shared a lot of my testimony that I'd never shared before. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there was a lot of brokenness in the pulpit, a lot of tears in the pulpit, just trying to work through those little parts in my life that were so painful. And then I found out once I got through that series of messages, there's power and there's healing in sharing those things. Mm -hmm. You know, I know I'm saved and I know I've got the Holy Spirit of God, but there's also power in sharing those things because God is a God who's able to take those things Amen. and turn them around to help somebody else. Wow. Brand new right. And unless you speak them, to bring honor and glory to God, those people that would benefit and that God would help through that testimony are not going to be helped. I can just see a person with your lifestyle and you're trying to help them. Look at if you trust Christ, you'll have a brand new life. Yes. And that person's hearing those words going, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. 
you writing this book, I, 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 <laughs> I can imagine Melissa. Did she, did she see the manuscript before you sent it off? No, actually, she didn't. You? No, she didn't. <laughs> because if I, if I wrote a book and I let Sharon see the manuscript, she'd go. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know this. Hmm. I don't think you need to put that in the book. <laughs> so you didn't even, no. you didn't even, did, after the book was printed, did you let her read a copy? Oh, yes, certainly. And what happened? Uh, she wept. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh. There's a lot in the book she didn't know. Mm. Yes, I, that, yes, that's what I'm saying right. is right. you, because writing, all of a sudden stuff comes back. Yes that you have buried. Mm -hmm. So you had to bring that up. That's right. And it's, it's things that I hadn't dealt with yeah. fully. <clears throat> you know, I knew that God had forgiven me because I accepted Christ as my Savior. And I really believe I had forgiven those who have sinned against me, you know, in the past. Wow. But as far as laying those things to rest, I hadn't done that. And so especially that uncle that sinned cleansing me. thing for you too. Yes, then. very much so, yes. And God's used it in my life to make me stronger, Pastor more mature. Dixon, that camera is yours. Share Christ with somebody watching. Wow. What I want to say to everybody who's watching this program today, you know, what is it that you're living for? Who are you serving? God loves you and God created you to worship Him and to serve only Him. And there's a problem that we all suffer from and that's that problem of sin. We've got it in our hearts and we can't save ourselves. We can't make what's wrong right. We need a Savior. And the good news of the Gospel is we have a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. I love Romans chapter 10 that tells us there in verse 9 that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And I'm just telling whoever's listening out there, I'm just believing in faith right now. There's somebody, the Holy Spirit, has got a hold of your heart. You can't explain it, but you know God's using this message to speak to you. God wants to bless you. God doesn't want to judge you. He wants to bless you. You'll bow your head and just ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart. Believe that He died for you and He rose again the third day. I'm telling you on the authority of the Word of God yes. and from experience, then you'll really begin to live. God loves you. Don't run from Him. Turn around and run to Him. Amen. Listen, this could be your day. That's right. Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Come into my heart. Change me. Mm. I remember in the Bible reading, Jesus said to a person that wanted to be healed, "Do you? What is it you want?" Mm. And he said, "I want to be healed." Mm. What is it you want? A new life? Ask him. That's right. He will change you totally, like Pastor Dixon. God bless you. Thank you for watching It's Time. If you have recently made a decision for Christ, Herman and Sharon would like to hear from you.